spoiler alert, I'm gay. I guess I just gave that away. <laughs> if my life were a, uh, were a TV series, uh, being gay, it would be, it would be like the, the season, the mid-season finale twist, you know, the cliffhanger that everybody would be talking about uh, around the water cooler, if people still do that anymore. Now everybody binge watches Netflix and nobody does that anymore. But anyway, if they did, that would be the thing that was like, I can't believe he was gay all along. I didn't know, didn't expect that. Uh, uh, growing up, because growing up, I was the last person in the world, at least that I thought, would ever be gay. Uh, I, my nickname in high school, given to me by a classmate, was God Boy. Uh, and this is because I was the kid who, I grew up in a, in a conservative Southern Baptist home uh, with two uh, deeply devout, deeply evangelical, very loving parents. Um, I was... I was the, the poster child for conservative Christianity. Um, my faith has, from a young age, been at the core of who I am. I accepted Christ at a very young age and um, reaffirmed that commitment as a teenager. And really, like, if you knew anything about me growing up, you knew that I was a Christian. I was very happy to tell you, repeatedly. Um, and so when my classmate nicknamed me God Boy, I don't think he meant it as a compliment. Uh, but I chose to take it as one because I was that kid that I saw my role as a Christian to be to know what was true and to sort of throw that truth at everyone I encountered in life who didn't know what was true so that they would accept what was true and be saved and then I could move on to the next person. I, on the subject of homosexuality, which is how my church would have talked about it, I had no doubts about what the truth was. I knew that I knew that being gay was a choice, that it was a sinful choice, and that it was my responsibility as a Christian to speak up against it, and so I did. And I told people, well, I, I don't think gay people are made that way, and I think they just need to know that God has something better for them, and so on and so forth. And that probably would have been the end of the story if it weren't for the fact that when I hit puberty and all my guy friends started to notice girls for the first time, I was having the opposite experience. I was starting to notice guys. And for years, I thought this was just a phase I would grow out of, and I tried not to think about it too much. But as I got older and it became more and more apparent that what my guy friends were feeling was not what I was feeling, I didn't know what to do with that. I considered myself straight. I dated girls. I had a girlfriend. But I had a guy friend who was absolutely lusting after my girlfriend, and I had no physical attraction to her whatsoever, or to any woman. And eventually, it got to the point that I was realizing this is going to be a problem, and I started praying more and more fervently about it, and ultimately got to the point where I was crying myself to sleep night after night, begging God, please don't let me feel this way anymore. And God didn't seem to be answering my prayer. Now, it never occurred to me at this point that maybe I was asking for the wrong thing, that maybe God wasn't interested in making me straight, because I had always assumed that, of course, God wanted to make all people straight. That's how God created people to be, right? But when I started to realize that this wasn't happening, it wasn't until I was 18 that I actually, the light bulb went on and I realized that there is a word for guys who are attracted to guys and that the word is gay. Up until that point, my image of gay men was that they spent their time uh, engaging in all sorts of strange sexual practices and marching in the streets in thongs for some reason. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I thought gay men did. And I was this, you know, really conservative, devout, devout, devout Bible, uh, Bible kid uh, who, you know, my, my identity was all about being a Christian. I was, had never been sexually active with anybody. I'd never even kissed anybody, including my girlfriend, much to her dismay. Um, yeah, I feel bad for her now. Um, and so I didn't think I had anything to do with gay people, but then when I was 18 and I started to make this connection, I was like, well, what does this mean? Because if being gay is a choice and I didn't choose it, and I guess it's not a choice, but you can't be gay and Christian, can you? And yet, I know I'm a Christian. And so I went to the Christians I respected and asked for their advice and 
um, and, and their insight into what I was going through. And the reality is they weren't prepared to have this conversation with me. All of them had grown up believing that being gay was a choice too. And so they all sort of said to me, well, just don't be gay. And I was like, well, that's what I've been trying to do and it doesn't seem to be working. And they, and they were like, well, just don't be gay. And I'm like, right, I still don't know how to do that. And um, I, got, I, I went through some really serious depression because I didn't know what it was that God wanted me to do. I found what were then called ex-gay ministries, Christian ministries to help gay people become straight, and got involved with those only to discover that even the leaders of these groups were not straight. Some of them had married somebody of the, op somebody of the opposite sex, but when I would sit down with them and, and talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, they admitted to me that they were still gay, they were still attracted to the same sex, and that one of the reasons that they didn't talk about this in their public testimonies was that they thought the church wasn't ready to hear the truth. And I thought something's really wrong if the church is the reason that people are being dishonest. Because if there's anything I know, it's that God is a God of truth. And so the church shouldn't be making people feel that they can't be honest about what they're going through. The church should be the place that everyone can be honest about what they're going through. And yet that didn't seem to be the case. So I started writing about my experience online and trying to figure out what, what God was asking me to do. And um, once I did that, I met lots and lots and lots of other people who were going through the same thing. And they were all lonely. And a lot of them were depressed. And a lot of them were afraid to tell the truth in their churches. In the meantime, I was just a college student trying to, you know, go through all of the, the stuff that you go through in college. And um, I, I remember multiple experiences of not feeling welcome in church. I'd always felt welcome in church. Church was my home. And yet there was a Christian chat room that I uh, frequented that I was in the chat room one day and all of a sudden this message popped up on my screen and it said, you've been banned from this chat. And I thought, what in the world did I do? And I sent a message to the person in charge and I said, hey, some, I think somebody hit a wrong button. It says I got banned from the chat and he just responded with one sentence. Are you gay? And I said, who said I was gay? And he said, we have a rule against gay people in this chat. This is a Christian chat, are you gay? And I didn't want to be dishonest but I hadn't said anything about being gay in the chat, so I didn't know how he knew, and, and I, I said, well, I, I am, but let me tell you my story. And I told him my story, and I told him about all the struggles and going to the ex-gay groups and trying to become straight and all the things I'd done and how it hadn't worked. And I, was, I said, you know, I'm not sexually active. I'm not dating anybody. I've never even kissed anybody. I don't know what God wants me to do. Maybe God wants me to be celibate. Maybe God will make me straight in the future. I don't know, um, but I, I'm trying my best to live as a Christian and to figure out what that looks like would you do anything any differently than I've done? And he said, I don't know, maybe not. And I said, well, now you know my story, and you know I'm not trying to like recruit anybody or whatever, can I come back in the chat? And he said, well, we have a rule, no K people in the chat, this is a Christian chat. And I was never allowed back. And so I looked at the Bible passages, and there are several Bible passages that explicitly mention same-sex sexual activity in, in one context or another. And so I said, well, you know, you could say um, all these passages have a, seem to have a negative view of that. On the other hand, all of these passages also, when you looked at the, the context uh, in the verses themselves, as well as the historical context, they were all in contexts where uh, it was easy to see why the behavior being condemned was sinful. Passages that dealt with things like idolatrous orgies and, and gang rape and, and things like that. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, clearly that's sinful, but that doesn't have anything to do with a question of, say, whether I could maybe uh, marry a guy someday or something. Like, I could make this argument and I could make that argument, and I could spend my time this afternoon making all the arguments for you, all the Bible arguments. But at the end of the day, there are always more arguments to be made. And that didn't give me any confidence of what it was God wanted me to do. Now, some folks would say, well, you know, why, why do we even have this conversation? Why, I mean, why is it not obvious from the beginning? Some folks would say, well, why is it not obvious from the beginning? Because it's just about do the, the loving thing, let people get married. But for me, there was this sense of, well, God sometimes requires sacrifice. So how do I know God's not asking me to sacrifice my, you know, future happiness and the desire to get married someday. 
Others would say, why are we even having this conversation? Because, you know, the church has had the same position on this for 2,000 years. Who are we to change the church's position for 2,000 years? Well, a couple of things about that. On the one, for one thing, the church hasn't been having this conversation for 2,000 years. The church has uh, historically uh, not allowed for same-sex sexual behavior, but also the church, for the vast majority of church history, assumed that all people were essentially heterosexual and that any same-sex sexual behavior was outside of marriage anyway. It wasn't really a topic the church was spending a lot of time debating. It's only been in recent years that the church has said, gosh, we've got like gay people in our congregation and a heterosexual marriage doesn't seem to be a good, a good fit for them, a good option for them. So what do they do? And some Christians would say the Bible uh, is clear in this way, that God created Adam and Eve, that gender is an essential part of marriage and has been since Genesis, and that the uh, passages that deal with same-sex sex are not just sinful because they also deal with things like uh, rape and idolatry, but because God's design and, and intent is only for sex within a marriage between a man and a woman, and that's the clear, consistent witness of Scripture. Others would argue that one of the things we see in Genesis is not just that God created Adam and Eve, but God doesn't want that first person, Adam. Adam, uh, Adam, who, who represents really not just Adam, but all of humanity. It's not good that that person, that Adam, should be alone. This is the first thing God says is not good in creation. Paul later says that it's better to marry than to burn with passion, that the Bible has this consistent uh, acknowledgement that people are lonely and that many of us, not all of us, but many of us feel called to marriage. And that, and Jesus, in dealing with the laws in situations where the letter of the law would seem to conflict with a, a spirit that would, that would uh, love and respect people, that where the Pharisees stood for the letter of the law, Jesus pushed repeatedly for the softening of those laws for the sake of the impact on human beings. That the Pharisees said, well, you can't do work on the Sabbath. This is one of the key laws that we have is no work on the Sabbath, and yet Jesus on the Sabbath repeatedly does work. He heals people, he allows his disciples to pick grain, and when the Pharisees want to argue with him about, okay, how many kernels of grain can you pick before it counts as work, or, you know, is healing work or not, Jesus doesn't even engage with that question and says, well, which is lawful, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Jesus says, if your child fell into a well or your ox fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you pull him out? We all can agree that's work, but aren't you going to do it? Because who's going to leave their child in a well overnight? So we argue back and forth about how to understand these passages and how to understand what the Bible is saying to us, but ultimately the more I studied the Bible and Jesus' way of approaching Scripture and approaching the law, the more I came to the conclusion that I believed God would bless same-sex marriages, and, and that's uh, what I stand for today. But I have many friends, many Christian friends, including some gay Christian friends who don't agree with me on that. And so the question for me is, on the one hand, what do I think the right answer is? Well, that's what I think the right answer is. Some of you probably are like, yes, I totally agree with you, and some of you are like, no. It matters. I think it matters to all of us. I don't think it's a non-issue. I don't think it's something we just go, well, you know, we'll just agree to disagree. It matters, right? Because if we say something's not sin that is, that's bad. If we say something is sin that isn't and make people feel unwelcome and they leave the church, that's also bad. There's not a safe answer. So we all agree that it matters that we get this right, but we don't agree on what the right answer is. And I would love to just say, so now all of you have to agree with me, and that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> and some of you would be happy with that, but I know some of you don't agree with me. So as a church, as we wrestle with this, the question is, how do we go forward? Where do we go from here? So I want to offer a few thoughts on that, and then bring the panel up and we'll have some conversation. 
So I think there are four things, practical things that we can do as we go forward. And the most important one is this. Listen. I think listening is the most powerful thing you can do on pretty much any issue where you have a significant disagreement with somebody. Whether it's this conversation, whether it's politics, whether it's a family quarrel, the thing that we so rarely do that we need to do more of is listening to the people we disagree with. And this isn't because we think that they might be right and uh, you know, we want to give them the chance to change our minds, although there are times when we think we're right and we end up being wrong and maybe they are right and listening to them uh, makes us aware of that. But even if you're 100% convinced that you're right and the other person is wrong, listening is valuable. Because when you listen, you learn a lot about what the other person thinks and why they think it. You learn about their story, about what they've been through, about why this is important to them. What are the underlying issues? Because maybe for this person you're talking to, this debate that you're having about how to interpret a Bible passage or what church policy should be, maybe that debate for them is not just a debate about church policy or a Bible passage. Maybe this is really a conversation about all the ways that they've been hurt or the ways that somebody they care about has been hurt and, and wanting to do the right thing and wanting to um, undo some of the damage that's been done. Maybe for them this is a conversation about being afraid of what's happening in the church or the culture. I mean, there are lots of things that people bring to these conversations and we don't know what they're bringing until we listen to them. And when we listen and give them a chance to be heard, it makes them far more likely than to turn around and listen to us in return. I think the more we listen, the, the, the better we'll be able to handle these conversations. And I think the second thing that we can do is, and this is gonna sound like a weird, very specific one, but we need to define our terms. Why do I say that? Because you would be shocked at the number of times I've heard Christians arguing about something stupid like, is being gay a choice? Which Christians still argue about. I, I travel around the country and I go to places where they're like, nobody still talks about that anymore, do they? And I'm like, yeah, the people I was just talking to yesterday were talking about it. Where I hear people arguing about something like, is being gay a choice, where after they argue for like an hour, it becomes suddenly apparent that they aren't even using the same definition for a word like gay. One person says gay is when somebody is attracted to the same sex and not attracted to the opposite sex. That's what gay is. The other person says gay is a socio-political identity that you take on that becomes the core of who you are, that means that all that you care about is your sexuality, and that is the core of your being instead of Christ. Okay, those are different definitions. So there, it's important for us to define our terms and, and, to be, and to be honest with each other about terms that we do or don't find helpful. Like, um, as a gay man, I really don't like when people say homosexual, and I have a lot of uh, friends who uh, say it in a very well-meaning way, but these days, for a lot of folks of my generation uh, and younger, the word homosexual carries a kind of clinical connotation and, and can be seen as offensive. Uh, generally, we prefer gay. Now, if somebody says, I would rather you call me homosexual, then call them homosexual. Um, there's a, there was, <laughs> used to be, there was this uh, Christian website that had a news feed on their website that they knew that the term homosexual was offensive to a lot of gay people. And so whenever news articles came through their feed that talked about gay people, they had a computer program that automatically changed the word gay to homosexual every time, right? Why would you even do that? Um, but it was really funny because there was an article about a sprinter named Tyson Gay. <laughs> and so I got a screen capture of this. This is a real thing. If I were doing slides, I would show it to you. Um, they had a, a, this news story on their website, and the headline was, Homosexual eases into 100 finals at Olympic trials. <laughs> and the article was like, Tyson Homosexual easily won his semifinal for the 100 meters at, US, at the US Olympic track and field trials. On Saturday, Homosexual misjudged the finish in his opening heat. <laughs> there are a lot of words that, that um, gay folks and LGBTQ folks more broadly uh, don't find helpful, like um, some of the words I always tell people to avoid are words like preference, lifestyle, and choice. 
um, because they, they imply that being gay is about uh, choices that we make and ways that we live, and my lifestyle is not at all what people imagine when they say a phrase like gay lifestyle. It's super boring. Um, words like uh, transgender and cisgender. If you don't know the term cisgender, cisgender is what most of us in this room are. It's, it's when you're um, the, the sex that, as they would say, the sex you were assigned at birth. This, when they say the, the, the doctor holds up the baby and says it's a boy or it's a girl, that's what they call the sex assigned at birth. Um, when your sex assigned at birth and your internal sense of gender identity uh, go together in the way they normally do. So the doctor said it's a boy and you identify today as a man, or the doctor said it's a girl and you identify today as a woman, that's cisgender. Um, so you'll probably hear that term with the panel when we're talking in a bit. Uh, or even something like LGBTQ. I use that phrase, as that, or that acronym has become the acronym these days. LGBTQ it used to be LGBT, and now it's becoming LGBTQ. When it was LGBT, I would always make a joke when I spoke to audiences and say, LGBT is, of course, a sandwich. It is a BLT with guacamole, and it's delicious. <laughs> I can't make that joke anymore because they added a Q on there, so now I have to put quinoa on my sandwich. <laughs> I have had an LGBT sandwich. I have not had an LGBTQ sandwich yet, but it sounds good, so. There are two more things I think we need to do. The third one is um, we need to share our stories. When this conversation comes up about LGBTQ folks in the church or about same-sex marriage in the church or whatever, we often we spend our time uh, just wanting to, to argue about things, about what is church policy, how do you interpret the Bible, what is God's will for this person or that person's life. Um, we argue politics. Um, you, would, you would not believe, or maybe you would, how often when somebody finds out that I'm gay and a Christian, the first questions that they have for me are like issue-related questions. Well, what do you think about this issue and that issue and that issue? And it's like, you know, I didn't at some point sign up to be on the gay Christian committee because I have positions on issues. Um, I'm gay because I've always been attracted to guys and not girls. I'm a Christian because I, I choose to follow Christ, and that's who I am. Um, I have lots of stories. I could spend hours telling you my stories about being gay and Christian, and I would much rather talk to you about how I feel about various issues after we've heard each other's stories. It's not that I think that stories give us the magic answer to all of the issues that we disagree on. But when we share our stories, we get to then talk across our various disagreements as human beings, instead of as stand-ins for issues. If, we're, if we belong to different political parties, um, and we just start there, we may start off with arguing. Well, people on your side do this, and people on your side do that, and you know. But if we sit down and and I say, when was it you first decided to be a, you know, whatever your party is? And you say, when did you decide to be, you know, what was the issue? What was the defining, what was the moment? What happened in your life? What's frustrated you? What's frustrated you about your own party sometimes? Then we can have some conversations where it's like, okay, I get you now. I get where you're coming from. I don't agree with you, but I get it. I get it. So I think the more we share our stories, the more we can have these conversations with grace. And ultimately, that's the last thing that we need to do. We've got to have grace for each other. You know, they will know we are Christians by our love, says the song, and says Jesus. They will know you are my disciples when you love one another. If we can't do that, then how in the world can we be Christ's representatives to a world that needs that love and that grace? We've got to be able to show grace to each other, to assume sincerity and good intent, to assume that this person who's sitting next to you, and that one, who maybe disagrees with you on some big issues, disagrees with you maybe for good reasons, that they don't view themselves as the, the villain of a story, even though you might see them as the villain because they're clearly in the wrong, 
but they see themselves as a protagonist, that everybody is the protagonist of their own story, and all of us are trying to do it the right way. And if I can understand that about you, even if I think you've gotten it wrong, then we can approach each other with some grace and some love and give each other the benefit of the doubt. And I think that's where we need to go with, with this conversation. One of my favorite quotes, one of my favorite quotes is by uh, a pastor you may know, Tim Keller. And I'm gonna close with this and then, and then bring the panel up. Um, he says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. And so as we have these conversations in our church, and as we make sure that all really means all, I think what we have to do is seek first to make sure that each and every person we encounter feels known by us and loved by us, and go out of our way not to just not preach at them, not to just not attack them, not to just say all are welcome here, but to get to know each and every person in their journey and figure out how do I show this person love now that I know what's important to them, now that I know what they've been through, how do I show them love and make sure that they feel both known and loved? And I think when we do that, we're on target to be the body of Christ. And now I would like to invite our panel to come up and we will have some conversation and they can tell you all the ways they disagree with what I just said and share a lot of their thoughts as well. So um, panelists, if you wanna come up. Thank you. So who wants to start? Shall I go first? Okay, um, can you all hear me? Yeah, I'm Chris Warren Dickens. I'm a psychotherapist here in Ridgewood. Um, I specialize in working with members of the LGBT community. Um, I also live here in Ridgewood with my husband and two daughters. Um, so this issue is very close to my heart, heart professionally and personally. Um, I'm really interested in how people manage the intersection of religion, sexuality. Um, it's come up in my professional life over many years in, in different ways not just with the Christian faith. Um, when I was in the uh, UK, I was working at London Friend, um, which was a few doors down from a, the local mosque. So I had a few um, gay Muslims trying to struggle with um, their identity as a Muslim and their identity as a gay man. Um, so this is an issue that's um, very interesting to me. And um, I want to bring uh, the mental health um, perspective to this. Um, looking at this from a trauma perspective. Um, okay. Hi there. I'm uh, Reverend Dr. Sherry K. Brink, and um, I'm an ordained minister and a not-for-profit leader, and my whole career has been kind of jumping back and forth across that line. Um, I've served three congregations, and in each of those congregations, there were LGBTQ people. Um, I believe that in every congregation of whatever sort and whatever faith and wherever it might put itself along the continuum from conservative to liberal, there are LGBTQ people. Sometimes those people were talking with me about it, um, sometimes they weren't. I'm at present the president and CEO of a place called Blanton Peel Institute and Counseling Center. We are a, a place providing affordable mental health care in New York City, Lower Midtown, and at present, we have about 2,000 clients, and 32% of them identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, some variation on that. We have a whole evolving nomenclature as to how people talk about that. And so I estimate that about 700 of our clients at present are, uh, identify as gay in that broad spectrum. Does that mean that um, 
LGBTQ people um, experience mental illness at a higher rate? No, I don't think so. Um, and, and many of us remember the day when to be homosexual was to be mentally ill. That was how it was defined. Hmm. Um, but there are certain mental health challenges and spiritual challenges that come for people who are LGBTQ. And that's part of what my uh, vocational career has centered around. <clears throat> Uh, hi, my name is Mark Miller, and um, you all have done well keeping to the time, so I'm setting a timer for myself. <laughs> 35 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hi, my name is Mark, and I am a musician, church musician, mostly composing sacred music, teaching, working in churches. Uh, traveling the countryside, spreading love through singing and, and music. I uh, want to thank the church for having us here today. It's a rich conversation already. Um, thank you, Dennis and Daphne. Uh, I grew up in the Methodist church. I'm United Methodist. My father, my grandfather before him, my sister right now just retired, her daughter, my niece, and my cousin are all United Methodist clergy. So uh, there was no escaping it uh, for me. I'm a lay person, but always involved in the United Methodist Church. Uh, I was playing the organ in high school in Berkeley Heights in Union Village, uh, United Methodist Church. And I was 15 when I found myself in my dad's office, unable to tell him what I was trying to express to him, and finally managed to get out the words, Dad, I, I think I'm gay. This is in 1983. And there was a pause, and my dad said, well, your mother and I love you no matter what, <laughs> and God loves you no matter what. And that moment for me was uh, galvanizing on so many way, in so many ways. Not only my dad, but my spiritual leader, uh, my dear friend, told me these words, which I knew to be true, but uh, set me on a course to, to realize, even at that age, that indeed everyone is a child of God. How do, we, how do we express that in our lives, and the values we live out, and the theology we communicate? Uh, uh, it was also interesting because I was a brown person in pretty much a, a sea of white uh, <laughs> growing up in Mendham, New Jersey, in Berkeley Heights, um, kind of like this church today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I say that too because I was adopted as a baby. My parents were white and uh, our family of seven uh, kids, five of us were adopted, I was telling you, and um, Korean, white, and black in our family. But uh, so I've, I've, it's been a journey for me. As a young person, I realized I was gay, very young, but uh, I kind of had to come out as a brown person, as a biracial African-American person. How, did, how does that, uh, connect to who I am as, as in, in my identity. Um, so th those, those pieces animate me today, and uh, it's a delight to be here, so thank you. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks, thanks all for your, um, thanks for, for being here and, and uh, for sharing those introductions. So we've got a bunch of questions from folks. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. I apologize in advance. I know we won't be able to get to everything, but we'll do our best. So, how do I help my LGBT teen who is transgender uh, get back involved into an affirming church body when he's been hurt by the church he grew up in and loved? I'm afraid he will walk away from God. Um, this is, you know, this is a this is a question I get a lot from parents um, who have a, a child who's who's come out, um, has, has felt hurt by the church, and now wants nothing to do with the church. And the parent says, I really would like my child to come back to the church. What, what do I do? And I know how I answer that, but I, does, do any of you have thoughts that you want to share? I'm giving you all the easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we at our church uh, in Summit, New Jersey, we recently had a transgender uh, choir member join, mm. and he happens to be from the college that I teach at, and 
he very graciously let me know between junior and senior year, after junior year, he pulled me aside and said, you know, I'm uh, transitioning this summer, and I just want you to know I'm changing my name from, uh, from a, f a female name to a male name and starting to go through this transition. And I was floored because it's the first time a choir member had come to me with this and wanted to say the words that my dad had said because someone had modeled for me what you're supposed to say when someone tells you something that is so transformative to who they are. You know, um, God Loves You wasn't quite appropriate in that sense because it was a, a university chorale, not a... But just to let them know that I supported them, you know, no matter what. And so, but, and our church is very open and affirming, and yet it's been a really interesting, they don't know what to say. Uh, should I ask him? Uh, I'm like, well, you don't have to ask anything, actually. Just let uh, this person be in the choir and share with them what they want to know. But, um, but I, I, I just wanted to put out there that being affirming to, sometimes to um, lesbian and gay, same gender loving couples who can sometimes transition into a hetero environment, oh, they're married or have kids or they're just like us, is, it's a little different, it's, we found it different to deal with the, um, you know, transgender is not the same as lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, intersex. So um, it's, I, I just want to say it's a growing edge for faith communities, but we, you know, we, want, we want to be welcoming and embraced. So I, I would say we need to be led by uh, the transgender voices that are going to tell us, mm -hmm. just like lesbian and gay voices tell us. I, I, I really agree with that. Um, I think there's a big difference between showing your accepting generally to the congregation um, and speaking to somebody individually. If you're speaking to somebody individually, you have to be led by them. You, you don't ask intrusive questions, you don't probe into getting informa unnecessary information. You let them start the debate or conversation if you want them to. Um, that's very different to how you address the congregation where I think you need to take extra steps to make absolutely clear that welcoming all means all members of the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a big difference between your individual conversations and how you um, um, position your message to your congregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to say two things that are in completely different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, one has to do with, um, I appreciated you defining cisgender for the crowd, and I appreciated you drawing the distinction between gay and lesbian and people who identify as trans or gender fluid or I think it's really helpful for us to keep having these conversations about the terms and how we talk about ourselves um, and to understand that um, sexual orientation is about who one is attracted to, who one imagines having romantic and sexual relationships with and gender identity is about how one understands oneself with respect to who they are as a person that in and of themselves. So it's one thing in a completely different direction. And then the question was about um, spirituality and um, how do I help them find the place for themselves? Um, you know, if I think about my own life and about the lives of my closest friends and what I know about them and their journeys, but then about the many people of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities that I've traveled with, um, people find their own way spiritually, and they may not land where you want them to land. There's a, a you know, you take one block out of the house, and things start shifting around, and, other things, and, and then the other things have to realign themselves. And, um, you know, to go with your respecting people's own sense of agency, you know, they're going to find their own way, and it may, not, it may not mean that they land where you would like them to land. Um, to, to that point, um, <clears throat> it's difficult uh, when, you would, when you care about somebody very much and, yeah. you, and you want them to get to a particular place, uh -huh. and, 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 they're not, and they're not there. 
And um, I know I have a lot, of, a lot of LGBTQ friends who have left the church. And it makes me sad that they've left the church because for me, uh, I think that the church is, is such a, a life-giving institution, um, both spiritually and for a lot of other reasons. I think there are a lot of really important, valuable things in the church, um, which is why even when it, I've been through a lot of difficult things with the church, I've stayed, um, even when it wasn't easy to. And I would like for everyone to experience that, and yet I also realize, you know, as you say, like, my friends are, are on their own journeys, and there is, there are no magic words I can say that will bring them to where I would like for them to, to yeah. be. All I can do is to love them and, and, and be their friend. And I think to parents who may be in that situation, um, my advice is um, to continue to love your child, stay in your child's life, um, and, don't, and don't pressure them because that doesn't tend to have the effect that you want. But do continue to work in your church and in other uh, churches where you have any, uh, any, any clout uh, to make them as much as possible the kind of place where somebody like your child would feel welcome. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that even though the, the church to you feels welcoming and is officially welcoming in this or that way, it may be that there are still things in that church that make your child feel unwelcome. Maybe not. Maybe that your child is just done with Christianity for other reasons that have nothing to do with your church. But it's worth at least exploring that and, 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 and making, doing what you can to help make your church the kind of place that other folks uh, will feel welcome so that no one else has to go through the experience of feeling so unwelcome in church. Yeah. So this person asks, uh, could you please reflect uh, for a minute on what is happening in the United Methodist Church? So we were having a little bit of this conversation before uh, this event started. Um, I, Mark, do you want to kick us off on this conversation? <laughs> Mr. Methodism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um... The Methodist Church is experiencing what many other mainline denominations have gone through, are going through. Uh, Presbyterians made it, Lutherans made it, uh, Episcopalian Church. The United Methodist Church is a little different in that we're this uh, worldwide denominational body with uh, about six Seven, almost seven million members in the United States and about six, almost the same in uh, Africa and Asia, uh, scattered also across Europe and uh, in Russia as well. So, uh, Eurasia. But um, recently we've had a meeting where uh, we voted to, uh, we had two plans before us. One, to let Methodist, United Methodist conferences become more uh, uh, independent in their own understanding of can you marry same gender loving couples, can you ordain uh, lesbian and gay. Interestingly, there's nothing in our discipline or law book about bisexuals or transgender people. So uh, for, for now, of course, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, prejudice knows no boundaries and discrimination. So, but right now, it's about lesbian and gay people. I'll say same, same gender loving people. And um, our conference, by a narrow margin, last week in St. Louis voted, voted down the more tolerant policy and uh, voted up the, as I call the Death Star option uh, of uh, saying that we, we will continue saying that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching will continue to say that we will not ordain gay people, will not marry them. And if you do, uh, the, the punishments have become much harsher and stricter. So that's what was voted on. Uh, I think the, the unintended consequence was that the moderates, particularly in the United States, have kind of been stirred awake and now the United Methodist Church, I'd say, in the United States is, uh, I don't know if we're going to split, but we've already um, kind of said it's certainly in the more um, 
I would say, open places in the Northeast, in the West, even in the Southeast, South Central and the North Central parts of our country, uh, more welcoming churches are saying, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to take a stand and say, enough is enough. We are, we're welcoming, we're going to marry, we're going to ordain. And um, so that might be the welcoming, that might be the hopeful sign out of some really difficult, contentious moments. Um, we were having, we were talking about the situation in the United Methodist Church um, backstage. Uh, we sort of segued from that into a, a conversation about intersectionality and the ways that, that our different identities um, intersect and, and how that makes some of these conversations a little more complicated. And I'm wondering if anybody wants to share any of your thoughts on that topic. Well, I'll start with this. <laughs> Being nudged. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Um, I'll start with this, that when we talk about intersectionality, um, it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. I'm not always sure whether we know what, you know, you talked about people having different meanings for different words. Mm. What, what I mean about it is the way that different aspects of who we are, different aspects of our identity, the ways that they integrate. And I was struck by, um, you know, Justin, you mentioned um, two different definitions of gay, one of which was this whole ideological, I'm out there marching all the time. I think one of the things that LGBTQ people have to sort of resolve as they come out is how much of their life are they going to let that aspect of who they are mm. take up. You've let it take up more of your life than I have. I, you know, different people find different ways as to, you know, how much of that they want to take up their life. But intersectionality is about how different aspects of our identity interact. Well, so, for example, I became aware for fairly early on as I was one of the first gay or lesbian ministers in my denomination to come out, I became aware that people were responding to me differently than they were to my dear friend who uh, presents very differently than I do. People will say, Oh, you know, Sherry, I didn't know you were a lesbian. Mm. This is an aspect of privilege that I wear as an LGBTQ person, that people respond to me differently. How people present becomes part of their identity. Um, uh, it also gets wrapped up in, with um, race and culture and uh, how, how I, as a white lesbian, am experienced. I became aware that I had an opportunity to speak in my denomination that other people weren't going to have because they were too lesbian, or other people weren't going to have because they were black and lesbian, or other people weren't going to have because they were, you know, and that, and that also I didn't get to speak in certain settings because I was a woman, and in certain settings in my denomination, ordained women aren't fully accepted. So all of this gets very complicated in the way it gets tied up together. Um, and my experience as a white lesbian is very different than what people experience who also have racism, all sorts of um, bias uh, projected onto them for other reasons. Uh, I, was, I was telling my colleagues about how uh, the, the, the strange place of being at General Conference for the Methodists in St. Louis a couple of weeks ago, leading a, um, a protest singing songs outside of the arena uh, in the lobby and looking around and it was, you know, a few hundred people and mostly white and a small group of black folks, African-American almost exclusively, thinking about, too, the fact that on the inside of the arena, 80% uh, maybe of the delegates from Africa who uh, voted for the more traditional plan, um, the the complication of having the, the, the splitting these, the majority of black people with the powerful uh, whites inside who, dare I say, were the same ones who voted for segregation 40 years ago, 50 years ago. There, it's, it's, it's a connection that uh, is, is profound and deep. Uh, so 
looking at that experience, it's the same thing I teach a class on heterosexism at Drew and say these strands of sexism, heterosexism and racism are all intertwined. You cannot, you, 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 you can't just pull one out and say we've dealt with it. You, they're all three are very, um, you know, and I know it when I'm hanging out with all guys and we talk, even if we're all gay guys, the, 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 the sexism that can creep into the, the uh, discussion or the, how we treat uh, other folks, it's there and we need to be conscious of it, just like uh, the racism that creeps in when I'm in a group, let's say, of all white LGBT folks uh, who seem to get blind, blind spots over the fact that, um, you know, that there are people that have known oppression for <laughs> just as long, just as deep, and um, we can't pit ourselves against one another like that. We need to continue, um, or, you know, old people against younger folks. Um, yeah, the word homosexual, that's very interesting you bring that up. I, I prefer you don't call me Negro. The, 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 the good Negro people, that, that was the word that we used, right? For then Afro-American, colored, black. I, I was called colored by someone recently, which uh, a woman said, you know, colored. And I was like, no, that's not the word to identify myself now. But um, I realized when the, when the Pope used the word gay, I thought, oh my gosh, hmm. yes, yeah, he didn't say homosexual. Because, you know, for some of us, homosexual is like if you called me colored or a Negro. So uh, we, as we emerge into our own identities as a, as a group, as people, um, you know, we need to kind of figure out all the intersections and, um, and as you said, the defining of our terms. And just picking up on language, the use of language, that can be difficult because language carries a lot of connotations sometimes when we use certain terms. Um, but also trying to fix, saying, oh, which terms should we use can be difficult because sometimes things are more fluid and, and yeah. we're trying to fix something that actually isn't fixable. It's more fluid. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be aware of that. Yeah. So we're, we're getting to the end of, of our time, but there were two questions here that kind of go together that I want to make sure that we get in before <laughs> we uh, wrap things up. Um, uh, so one person... Um, asks if, if a, a member of a traditional congregation wanted to start a conversation about being a welcoming congregation, what would be the best way to start? And somebody else wrote, um, how do we minister to LGBTQ people in contexts where the church is not willing to publicly advertise that? For instance, when you, when you can't adver advertise that you've got a dedicated small group for LGBTQ folks. So those are not the same question, but they're related questions, I think, in terms of what practically do we do for folks who are in churches that are on the more theologically conservative traditional side of this, but are wanting to, to move things in a direction of being more welcoming. How, how do you make that happen, especially if you're not the person in charge? Um, I mean, in some ways, that's the you know, $100,000 question, right? But do any of you have thoughts on that? I might start with empathy, trying to get people to understand what it's like to live as a part of the LGBT community, and maybe um, that might help them see what the difficulties might be and how um, we can possibly open up to them. Mm. So empathy. Yeah, empathy. I would say invite Justin to your church. <laughs> <laughs> True. I would True. say that too. <laughs> let, me, let me, well, thank you to the five of you who clapped. Yeah. The rest of you are on my, over there. Like, yeah. <laughs> your fan club. My fan club, yeah. You know, I don't know how, whether this really connects with that question, but I'll tell you what's coming to my mind. Mm. Um, I said earlier that every of the three churches I've served as a minister, in each of them there have been LGBTQ people. Um, sometimes they've talked with me, sometimes they haven't. But it is just statistically impossible that in a congregation of 10 or more people, 
that there are not the parents or the siblings or the of LGBTQ people. The, 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 it's just statistically impossible um, that there aren't those who love LGBTQ people mm. in that setting. And I think um, in some way that's how things in my own denomination started out, was by starting to have conversations among parents of LGBTQ people. But just people starting to gather. I can't tell you the number of times, eventually um, after I lost my job and I was free to do whatever I wanted to do, um, we started an organization called Room for All for the Reformed Church in America. And one of the things we did right from the very beginning was not just including LGBTQ people, but including allies, including parents, including um, people who had some reason to care. Uh, and I think that's a great place to start is by finding common ground. But on the way to starting that group, the number of times that three or four of us got together to have coffee, or the number of times that then another group of five met up in Manhattan, people driving from ours just because we were so hungry to connect to each other. Just starting to have those conversations in smaller settings and figuring out, well, then how can we, then how can we nudge it forward? Hmm. And, and just to finish off the trauma perspective, um, a society can traumatize people, but it can also heal people. So I think that's worth bearing in mind. Yeah. We have a potential a, a very powerful potential to heal yeah. um, people's trauma. Mm -hmm. so. mm. yeah. It's uh, being a music person, uh, music heals for me. It's always been healing. And I would hope that a church might think of creative ways in their liturgy to um, pray, to, to preach, to, to sing music that is going to be welcoming to all people and know they're loved. You know, I, I pulled up a piano. I'm, I'm shameless because I, I can't, I, I do music, I... So let me jump in at Mark and say, what he says is true. Mark served the congregation that I served before I served it, and a song that he wrote just was always one of my favorites. We actually sang it uh, at, at our wedding. I'm pointing to my wife back there, my wife and I, and everybody who was gathered. And um, part of what that song was about for me, and, and the, the then director of music, who was Mark's, one of Mark's successors, um, he was like, oh, Sherry's requesting music. She's gonna request that Mark song. <laughs> about welcome, welcome to this place. We're all invited to be, to use Justin's words from earlier, to be seen and to be known. No. Yeah. Music heals. Um. Yeah, you know, I, it, my own response to the, the questions about how we, uh, you know, get these, these, these conversations started in churches, um, I, think, I think it is so important for people to be able to gather and, and have the conversation. And so uh, to the person who said, well, what about in those churches where you're not allowed to even advertise uh, a group for people to, to meet? Um, that's where I think it would be worthwhile to have a sit down with the, the pastors or whoever is in charge who's making that decision and, and, and see if they would be willing to engage some on uh, what it actually means for somebody to be gay or bi or trans. Um, and because, because often I think there is an assumption that if you, if you have a group then you're somehow endorsing, you know, the theology or decisions of everybody in the group and the church isn't there and whatnot. But, but even in churches that have very, very uh, traditional or conservative theology on, on these topics, there's no biblical reason I can think of to not allow people to at least meet and, and have a conversation and feel um, loved and cared for. And I, and I think often it's just a misunderstanding about what people are going through. And, and if they can hear some stories um, or you know, have some conversations that in a safe space, uh, it, it may move them to change that policy. But I love uh, what, uh, what you said, I think, about parents, uh, that when parents get together, I have found in more churches that it's the, the parents who uh, get things rolling, the parents who say, hey, uh, our, you know, this is about our children, and they get the attention of the pastoral staff and start the conversation going forward. And so I, I uh, encourage parents to 
as you said, get together and, and connect with other parents. Um, our, our time's up, but I wanted to give you all a chance to say uh, one final word. So um, in addition to letting people know how they can get in touch with you if they, if they want, if you have a, a website or organization or uh, whatever that you want to let people know about, um, I, I wonder if you could say in you know, a sentence or two, um, if we're talking about all being welcome, what does it look like to you to feel welcome, to know that you're really welcome in a space? I know, it's a tough question. It is a tough question. And you can all be thinking about that as well. What does it look like to you to feel welcome? Anybody want to? Well, maybe um, for me, a part of what I've come to trust is my internal gut, that I'm breathing deep and that, oh, OK, I'm welcome here. <sighs> hmm. I can I can be who I am, but and but I don't. But that's not an external thing. But that's what came to my mind. Yeah, and if people want to get in touch with you, oh, um, at Blanton Peel Institute and Counseling Center, uh, 30th Street and Fifth Avenue. Uh, get on the train station, which I'm told is just over here, <laughs> <laughs> uh, into Midtown Manhattan. We're at 30th Street and Fifth Avenue, and BlantonPeel.org is our website, and there are some brochures out on uh, the table. Just the word when you said that was relief, I guess. Um, you can breathe more easily um, and gradually feel yourself. Mm -hmm. So the word is relief. Yeah. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, um, I'm actually in Ridgewood, uh, 162 East Ridgewood Avenue, um, Suite 4B. Um, and I have a website, www.exploretransform.com. Um, and I'm Chris Warren Dickens. Is Good. he going to sing? Oh. Ah. <laughs> this is a song I wrote for right uh, this moment now. No matter what people say, say, think about me. I am a child. I am a child of God. No matter what people say, say or think about you. says no matter what the world says says or thinks says or thinks about me I am a child I am a child of God no matter what the church says no matter what the church says Decisions, pronouncements on you. You are a child. You are a child. You are a child of God. The bridge goes, and there is no thing and no one who can separate. They can't separate. Someone, you are family, you are meant to be a child, a child.